I, I really want to talk about one text uh, that has really been forgotten in translation studies. It's Derrida, Du Trat à la Philosophie, which the right to philosophy, on the right to philosophy. Of course, it's always going straight to philosophy, as one expects in Derrida. Nothing is simple, especially in titles. And it's a continued reflection on higher education, particularly on the place of philosophy within higher education, but also other issues, the relation between higher education and the state, in particular philosophy and the state, philosophy and state languages. And uh, it's a whole nest of very interesting problems for which the main solution is this term translation. And this, this quite uh, long book constitutes Derrida's major reflection on translation, and it really hasn't been picked up. I'm aware of just one lecture by, by the much regretted Daniel Simeone uh, on this text. Uh, people, Derrida has a text, Des Tours de Babel, which is his title in English, on, on Benjamin, and people refer to that. But this is a much richer reflection for the kinds of problems that I think we're dealing with here. Now, when uh, Derrida gets to translation, he uses the term in specific concept, contexts. In particular, uh, the way that a philosopher writing in French will read and use and rework in this case, philosophers writing in German. Uh, so the first major reference comes out to his work on uh, reading uh, Heidegger, as we would expect. And he says that as we do this, we enter into Heidegger's text, we become aware that we're not translating phrases or sentences, we know this, but a whole system of references and terms that Heidegger calls Denken, does Denken, to think, Okay, and that this system is what we have to bring across. Then, of course, that system is embedded in a particularly German institution, and we have to negotiate the differences between the institutions involved. And that's what the, the latter part of this book does. Let me focus, however, on this uh, shift of position that happens as we engage in this translation process. We move into another place of sense or of meaning into the space and the times of a translation of thought. Uh, you'll pick out, of course, that there's a shift here from uh, a pensée as a verb to denken as a verb. This is an activity, a process uh, that finishes up with the nouns, uh, translation and thought. There's a shift between the process and the product there, which remains problematic. And you'll find that the underlying process at stake here, the verb that's setting up all of this, is uh, tradition, to translate. The action of translating becomes that of thinking and the style of reading, producing translation and thought. Uh, what interests me here is uh, the rendition, if you like, of das Denken, the verb to think as a substantive, is in uh, Derrida here the verb translation. And this is a constant throughout this quite long text. Why does Derrida insist on this special place for this activity of translation? Well, the first reason is that it's his own practice in this text and many others. Um, this is just an example. It's a whole lot of French. If you don't know French, that's fine. What you should be able to pick out is he's reading the German terms. That's a bit of German, okay? It's a phrase from Kant. Uh, it can be translated as one can only learn philosophy. One can only learn to philosophize. One can learn to philosophize only, and so on. And the act of translating, in this case into French, the problems of which options you choose creates this space and time of translation. 
How do we render it? What is in that German? It could be this, or this, or this. And this is the process that Derrida uses in his own verbal action of thinking, translating, philosophizing, if you like. It all becomes one. What interests me here in this particular text is at the end, <clears throat> the action of translation marks out the difference. <clears throat> His aim is not to produce the correct reading of Kant, although he often delights in correcting the standard translators, uh, but of producing equivocation, l'équivoque, the place of the standing ambiguity of it could be that or that or that, and we don't really know. Uh, this aiming for equivocation Instead of aiming for equivalence, which is what standard translation theory might want him to do, uh, transforms this into a method of thought rather than a production of products. Products in the sense of a standalone translation. So here we're aware that he is translating. He's translating as a way of reading, as a way of interpreting. It's an entirely hermeneutic operation for which the standalone product, the translation that replaces the start text, is not an issue. We're going to show philosophy as this process, this ongoing process, which in turn is an invitation uh, for others to continue. The term equivocation, equivoc, here uh, has been picked up by Brazilian anthropology, a writer in Rio de Janeiro, who, who proposes that in the kind of cultural translation we have in anthropology, the aim should be equivocation. I originally thought it was a cult from Spanish. Equivocation in Spanish is a mistake. Uh, here it's not. It's uh, an ongoing, substantive, durable, multiple ambiguity. We live with these uh, problematics that are not entirely solved. So much for the space and the practice. It's a constant in Derrida. I've used it myself in some texts. Douglas Robinson these days is producing two books a year, simply doing this, picking up great texts and reading them in detail and interrogating them to tease out meanings we didn't see were there, hopefully to solve problems along the way. Now, Derrida is trying to solve problems in this text. Uh, it's a text of uh, occasional papers, papers written to address problems that were his along the way, and the foundational problems uh, were problems. Were that after years of having been a maître assistant, which would be an assistant professor in France, well below his academic status, in 1984 he was at last elected to a position at the L'Ecole Lyotitude, of the School of, of Advanced Studies in Social Sciences. So at last he had some academic recognition in France. And at the same time, 1983 was the foundation of the International College of Philosophy, of which he was the first director. Now, those two things were problematic for him. Um, the college, the, the international People said it was Mitterrand's gift to him to have him stay in France. And it's a state-subsidized institution, it still is today, founded, as Derrida himself says in the text, in the presence of three ministers, so it's three ministries that are involved in this. But Derrida poses the question, am I therefore working for the French state? And he insists, that the college and philosophy was self-founded in the presence of the French state. But this was a climate where Mitterrand had recently come to power and the general talk among intellectuals of the left was to participate. And this was his act of participation, somewhat reluctantly one feels. Now, in talking about that self-foundation of philosophy being uh, using money from the state but not being responsible to the state, this space of translation becomes a very, very key kind of answer. It's a difficult problem for most of us, I hope. And it's a 
an essential problem in translation studies since, I believe, 2002 and three. Uh, could you imagine me saying that you are all receiving money from the state of the United Kingdom and you are therefore guilty of an illegal war in Iraq and other iniquities enacted by this government and I will boycott all of you because of it, because you belong to the state. That has happened in translation study. Oh, not for you, but for Miriam Schlesinger and Gideon Turi, uh, to, in whose honour I owe it to myself to mention this fact. This has been a problem for us in translation studies. It might be good to look at how Derrida addressed this problem, rather than be involved in rather absurd discussions about which country is worse. Derrida's answer in the College of Philosophy is twofold. One, it's international, which means multilingual and inviting people in from other countries. Okay? And the second is that philosophy will intersect with all other fields of thought in the humanities as much as possible. And this is, this is the original, and it's still the menu of activities. We look at philosophy engaging with, and that line, that, what do you call that? That line, that, that relationship is translation. Translation is used to describe those intersections between disciplines. And the work of philosophy is to enact those intersections. Now, in the text, dealing with that problem, translation is more than a metaphor. In, in, in much of what we read, it's a convenient metaphor for any discipline that was held back by binary divisions or national boundaries that no longer mean very much. Translation comes in as, oh, this other thing that lets us get rid of that previous paradigm. Here, though, it is thought through in the terms of linguistic translation. For example, the imposition of French as a national language is rewritten, following Baliba, but rewritten as a prohibition to translate into other languages and an obligation to translate into French. That is, that the national language French became a national language through translation policy, notably prohibition of other languages receiving translations. Logically, if you are working in a space of translation, you can bring out translation practices that oppose the translation practices that instituted the, the, the state language. So translation becomes something that's working on both sides of this opposition. And you are, are enabled, you're, you're able to engage with it because it's the same activity but using different directionalities and different modalities on, uh, on both sides. Not by chance, uh, Antoine Bernman gave his first lectures at the college in 1984, that is straight after the, the foundation of it. I was very pleased to do the same thing ten years later. At the stage, I was just a postdoc from Göttingen in Germany. Uh, uh, I didn't deserve that honor, but there it was. And translation is still there at the moment. There's a seminar on uh, uh, Poétique des Intraduisibles, uh, the poetics of untranslatables, given half in Rio de Janeiro and half in Paris. So translation has been there in this institution. It has been working with the support of the state but it's been working to do more than a court intellectual, if you will, or a support of a national language. The main text on translation in this book comes later, though. It's when Derrida looks at prior examples where people have attempted to solve this problem problem of what we're doing with relation to the state and languages. Uh, Kant, the Streit der Fakultät, the, the conflict of faculties, uh, took a position 
in 1798, so we're going right back, right back to a stage in Germany where the state was not a negative thing. The state was a, 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 the future of the Germanic people and, and the language and the culture it was a dynamic, organic thing that people wanted to participate in. And uh, Kant uh, recognizes that there are some faculties that should be under state control and other faculties that should not in a rather strange division that I haven't got time to go into here. Derrida's concern is not so much with, with that as with Schelling's critique of it. In these lessons, these lectures that, that Schelling gives in 1802, 1803, referring back to Kant and taking issue with these divisions between the faculties and that some should be controlled and others shouldn't found that a rather bizarre way to proceed. Schelling takes the position that the divisions between our academic discourses are false. Uh, he insists, for example, that there is poetry in philosophy and philosophy in poetry. And there should be philosophy in uh, literary criticism, for example. Uh, just as there is philosophy in mathematics and beauty in mathematics. And, and this kind of comparison finds very quickly relations between all the existing disciplines. Derrida is obviously very pleased because he writes well, and, and yes, there is a lot of poetry in, in Derrida, uh, as anybody who likes good French can appreciate, I think. This means that with respect to philosophy, Schelling is right up front and says, no, philosophy is not one that should be controlled by the state. It's not even one that should be in its own faculty. This philosophy should be everywhere in all the studies. It should be everywhere and nowhere. It should be the activity that finds the relations between the existing disciplines. And Derrida quite consciously picks up the Beziehungen, the, the relations, and says, ah, I'm going to translate that as translation. Philosophy is the activity that finds the translations between the disciplines. I should also note Derrida's writing at the time of Michel Serre, La Traduction, who does these wonderful things of, of you know, notably thermodynamics being translated into Turner's paintings, uh, finding these relationships between art and thought and science uh, called translation. So Derrida is not the first to go down that road. This means that for Schelling, in this vision, the university is a system of translations in the sense that it's a university to take the different fields of knowledge and attempt to make them one. Uniformation. Uh, that is also, as Derrida says, a poetics of translation. Um, Schelling, being a good Christian, goes a little bit further and says that in discovering the relations between all the fields of science, we are coming closer to nature, which is the essence of God, and discovering how to supplement that nature. Uh, Derrida strangely forgets about deconstruction at this moment and rather likes this great aspiration to a rather complete knowledge. He insists on the supplement bit. Supplement was in the, his discourse at that time, and that's okay. But you can see this aspiration to a more complete kind of knowledge that can be related through translations between disciplines is definitely appealing, definitely what he would like to see happening in his own college in Paris. I hasten to add that the term deconstruction was not used in this text at all. The main text, the reading of Shelley, uh, I first read in German, strangely enough. It was translated in a book in 97 uh, uh, on translation and deconstruction, even though the text doesn't use the term deconstruction. And, Derrida uh, would say said to show this thing people call deconstruction, uh, to sort of hold it at arm's length. Uh, 
But it had an impact uh, through that text in German thought. You pick it up. I haven't found it referenced in English texts except for the Simeone, but I, my knowledge is limited. Uh, Derrida makes the point that this kind of translation activity is necessarily reflexive, and you can see that happening in his text and his mode of reasoning. And so the appeal to reflexive translation, being opposed to product-based translation or non-hermeneutic or equivalence type translation, has been a constant in German thought. From this text, also from Gadamer and the noble hermeneutic tradition that has become strong in Germany. So when uh, Dilek Dizda in Gerlersheim has a research group uh, uh, on politics of translation, she is definitely talking about what she calls reflexive translation, which is this kind of activity. And her teaching is literally this kind of activity, is getting Heidegger and how is he translated into all these different languages. Let's get down with the text and discuss it and see what happens in the languages, why it happens, why we can improve and learn from each other. The other main impact within Germanic translation studies has been on what they call cultural translation. It's not quite the same as what cultural translation is in this country. But this has spawned projects to extend translation studies into all fields. Uh, this is a text by Bachmann Medic. The whole issue is dedicated to this, of basically to her idea of a translational term, not in translation studies, where we've had all the terms we can handle, but in the humanities, where she is observing this tendency for, for many uh, people working, not just in, in literary studies, uh, but in anthropology, um, in sociology, in economics even, where they have a cross-cultural comparative perspective to start to use the term translation to look for these kinds of connections. So she's suggesting that people in translation studies, that's you and me, I guess, uh, should be quite good at analyzing not just translations, but all situations of global encounters, uh, all research practices, interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. We can take on the world. You see that, that aspiration that was in Schelling, that was a temptation to Derrida, is very much a project for this kind of cultural translation in Germany, with very good sociologists especially on board. Uh, Joaquin Ren is, is, is a sociologist I read with great pleasure, and he is looking at complex multicultural societies and the relations between the groups in terms of translation. And I think that's, that's very good sociology. Or at the network theory in French is called uh, sociologie de la traduction, uh, uh, translation and sociology. And they're doing very similar things. So it's not just uh, some people who are specialists in literatures and languages saying, oh, good, I'm going to explain the whole world now. It does involve working with specialists from other disciplines. That said, I find very little close analysis of what translation means. Uh, Bachmann Medic says we should take the translation concept and say what is transfer, what is mediation, what is metaphor, what is a linguistic dimension, and so on. I find very little of that kind of close analysis. In this country, there is a rather wider and a more embedded tradition of cultural studies, going back to Raymond Williams and others. And so cultural translation um, has taken root rather easily, but in a different kind of sense, uh, not related to the hard sciences, not really related to sociology, as far as I can tell, as has been the case in the Germanic tradition. So when I turn to uh, Sarah Maitland's book, What is Cultural Translation, coming out this year, I find a lot of hermeneutics, a lot of recur, a lot of relations between self and others and hermeneutic movement, a lot of theory, as we defended yesterday, and a few examples. And the examples leave me perplexed. This is where I'm going to lead to a critique 
of all the good things I've been presenting to you. Okay. Now, Sarah gave a talk in Nottingham last year on this, and you'll see her there. Lovely person, lovely presenter, really good hand-drawn slides. You can see the recur hermeneutic movement and stuff. And, and you can see me, this is reflexive translation study, folks. That's, that is my hate <laughs> reflecting cultural studies to you. <laughs> I, I, I just found it on a website, on a blog, of somebody else who was there. And, and she complained that the blogger started off saying, Anthony Pym started saying that we live, all live in multicultural, multilingual societies, and uh, because of that multiplicity, we all translate a bit. And, and the, the girl listening was somewhere in the back, she was editing the film or something, I don't know. And she said, I only speak English. I can't engage in this. He's excluded me. And I'm oh, sorry about that. Uh, if I thought about it, I would have said, yes, there are levels of English and translation within English. Fine, we could have handled that problem. But um, I was the bad guy in that blog, and Sarah came in with this wonderful model where everybody is translating all the time. And the blogger was very happy, uh, which is why she put the back of my head in that photo, I guess, as a kind of revenge. Uh, Sarah's uh, example in that lecture, I hope she doesn't mind me, what well, was in the blog, so I'm citing a blog and that's public knowledge, was a, a case in the elections, the American presidential elections, where candidate Donald Trump accused her candidate Hillary Clinton of playing the woman card. You know, you're going to get votes because you're a woman. That's not fair. And so the Hillary camp comes up with this wonderful retort, which is producing the woman card that you can go and get from them. And this wonderful card, providing membership to the Club of Women, gives you a right to a 17% discount in your salaries, among many other <laughs> negative benefits. Okay. Really, really a clever piece of electioneering. Okay. And uh, Sarah says, well, look, this is cultural translation. You've picked up a meme out there, used in one way on one side, the women's card, and you've translated that into a physical event which transforms the nature of the meme and turns it back on itself. Good. <coughs> Good. Very good. I mean, yes. <laughs> what is it that bothers me here? What is it deep down that, that says, yes, that's exciting stuff to do and let's go ahead with it, but something in me says, wait a minute, what is it? It's because that kind of thing, but not, uh, that, that's just one example, other things, things other than language translation are occupying the space of our training. I mentioned the course that I'm planning to give in Melbourne, uh, that's for all languages. I've called that language translation, in part because there's a medical faculty that uses translation in sense of the transfer of knowledge, and that's really interesting stuff to look at, but I'm looking at translation between languages, okay? And I think there are skills there that are rather different rather harder, let's say, than the general kind of stuff you could include in this all-embracing cultural translation. Now, you'll see that some countries, France notably, has a lot of language-specific classes in their masters. These are programs in the European Masters of Translation. Happily, uh, Lancaster is not there, so you're safe. I'm not gonna... But you'll see that it's not specific. In the UK, um, if you pick on the, you know, if you're not good at languages, but you want to get a master's in translation, you can avoid the optional ones and just go for the ones that are obligatory. The average is, is about 15%. That is, in your master's in translation, an average of 15% will be language-specific classwork. You'll do a translation, 
That'll be outsourced to a professional translator who will give you feedback on it. But I mean, is that what you, you could have done that anyway? It would be much cheaper. Uh, but is that what you're paying these huge fees for to come down for just 15% of that kind of class activity? Uh, in the UK, this is the breakdown. This is taken from websites and we have confirmed it with the program coordinators who have deigned to reply to us. You will notice that an EMT, European Masters of Translation Studies, at the University of Hull, according to the website that we looked at in 2015, had no language requirements. Guess where Sarah Maitland was working? <laughs> Guess where cultural translation really comes into its own? And that for most of the others, not all, it's variable, the percentage of obligatory language-specific classes is below 20%. <coughs> I understand the problem. This is exactly the problem I'm dealing with. If I want to do Chinese where I can just turn on the tap and fill up the number of students, along with Spanish, French, German, whatever, where I find it difficult to get students, all I have to do is make the common classes a huge percentage. And the higher the percentage of classes in common, the more money I'm making from this master's. Okay? And that's what's happening, I think. I don't know. But I know in my situation, when I have discussions with our dean, that's it. It's a calculation of how much money we want and how much we really care about the language skills of those students doing translation and their capacity to move out from the masters into the market. These are one-year masters. So that's 20% of one year. At least in Melbourne I have a two-year masters. I have, we have a two-year masters uh, which currently has about 80% language specific. Okay? And there's a difference in the kind of student you're producing there. What bothers me, and this is just to conclude, what bothers me, I think, deep down, is that a lot of the work we're doing, it's not about languages, not about language translation, is exciting stuff, it's great theory, it can constitute that shelling type vision of the university and the connections. It's a wonderful research activity. And let it proceed. Yes, but there is something else. Derrida is not cited a lot in translation studies because at the end of the day, he had a very conservative view of translation. It did concern languages. It did concern trying to get things to line up at marveling and, 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 and having a productive use when they don't line up. He was talking about, to solve his problems, another place of meaning the time and place of translating thought. And in a lot of the work we're giving, a lot of the things we're looking at in so-called cultural translation and theories, we're talking about translation. We're not on the level of the difficulties of movement between languages, where what is at stake is that intimate relationship between language and thought. If we lose that, we are at serious risk of deprofessionalizing the translators we produce. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Anthony, for a really thought-provoking uh, talk on translation and languages. I think it's it's really nice to, to have that, uh, that that perspective uh, brought back to the grounding of translation, where we are coming from. Yesterday, we were sort of branching out towards precisely the, the cultural translation thing. Uh, and you you went back through that history uh, in a, in great detail, and it's really enlightening to see where it comes from and how it relates to the history of thought as well as uh, uh, the, the institutional context. Uh, but it's also important that we do get, go back to those roots and the and, and the groundwork uh, we need to have a, we need to do. So I would just like to open it for questions and comments. Yes. Just on that, we're off about an MA program from compulsory models specific to language. The question that you asked, was it framed? Um, my experience of teaching on the MA in Birmingham is that the more
what it was that the students want to do, the way in which they can put together their masters, effectively all their modules are optional, but they have to do a certain number of these options. Mm. Um, that pattern's reflected in your, your questionnaire, because you know, when we look at that, we expect to see no yeah, yeah, yeah. compulsory modules in the, yeah. in the language, if you sort of mean. Yeah, uh, it, it, this is a difficult study uh, to do. And as you might know, we put the study on academia. It was a discussion, that means a debate. And the whole, everybody came out and said, you got it wrong, you didn't calculate this correctly. And so we went back and said, well, give us the exact numbers. You know, we want to do this, help us do it. Uh, but there was a general, you know, people in the EMT were very upset about this uh, because they were sure we got it all wrong. But you can't give us give us the right number then. Yeah. Right? No, it's very interesting, provocative. I mean, really, you go to see it. I'm going to pack and have a look at it. Okay. Well, uh, you're there, you know. But you, I mean, 22, 22. You're you're doing well. You're you're, you're relatively above the average. No, I expect the number to be much lower. No, we did have to take account of. Um, put yourself in the position of a student. Uh, okay, we said I'm a Chinese student who has weak English because I've got quite a few of them. What can I do to avoid the hard bits? You know, and, and the, these are the numbers we cannot come up with. Um, the people in Hull didn't sort of disown it. You know, said no, that was, that was a previous one. I said, well, look, we've got a, we've got your website, and we did the analysis on your website. You know, please explain this. And uh, it, it, it okay. really, it really. Uh, I'm in the 20% or the in Melbourne or the 80% here. I'm, I'm teaching in the bit that's, that's common to the languages. I happen to have Chinese students. My Chinese is awful. But I prove to them in class we get a translation to do. They do it manually. I, I post edit Google Translate. It's a field I know. And, and I reckon I produce a better translation than them. They're really upset. <laughs> And then, then we start to teach, you have to teach post-editing techniques. I think if you're not doing that, you're, you, especially for, for language pairs where it really works well, which is Chinese-English, Japanese-English, it doesn't work well, you, you might not want to go too far there. Um, I have to give them those skills. And I have to show them the skills that I can use even as a non-speaker to produce a translation that I then verify with a, with a, speaker, with a native speaker. So yeah, I don't think... Um, that's the problem, or the solution, really. Okay. Uh, yeah, but we teach post-editing, a, lo a lot of uh, uh, translation memory work as well. You have to, you have to teach all of that. The real question for me is, would, and when I pass a master's student, would I let them translate my work into a language I don't know? Well, that's scary. Yeah. In part because they're paying a lot of fees and you don't like to fail people who pay that much money. It's a very big economic pressure. Okay. Um, you ended up on a call for more language specific um, classes in, in translator education. And yet um, you started with the idea of offering a course of languages for all, for all languages. And I'm just curious how you would teach that, how you would um, balance that with language-specific yeah. education. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I've been working on this for eight years in Monterey. Um, I've been teaching a translation practicum with six, seven languages all present. And uh, I, there's a paper on my website describing how the solutions I found. The focus is on process. 
you know, the process product thing at the beginning in Derrida. Uh, forget about the product. Get people to, students, to do screen recording, a lot of what they're doing, look at their process, and then we try different variables. We, we do research about questions nobody can answer, like is it beneficial to do post-editing as opposed to translation from scratch? What's it like going into A or going into B language? What, how does that compare? What happens when you're made to go fast? Uh, all these variables we look at, they all concern process. Uh, if I have two students with a non-English language, they check each other, so there's a check, some kind of rough check, they can't just produce any old stuff, uh, but uh, the trick is process, not product. Um, yeah, I feel I, uh, I should come back to you on the, the whole example, so come to the external example. Oh. <laughs> professional who will revise your work. So it's the same solution being used. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it, it, it's also a function of how big your teaching body is and what, what languages they're able to, to uh, cover themselves. But which leads me to kind of my, my question, are you, it, it, from your presentation, it seems to me to be aimed kind of at two audiences. On one hand, it's universities and their approach to language teaching and the cost of language teaching and urging universities to invest more resource in this, presumably, but also are you suggesting that EMT should have a kind of minimum uh, and should look again at its kind of membership criteria? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I mean, the people in France who are that 80%, or Monterey at 80%, or the, the one I'm in, in Melbourne at 80%, and you look around and say, wait a minute, that's only one year and, and so few hours? I mean, it wasn't just this variable. We looked at how people check the language skills of incoming students. Because I, I agree, if somebody comes in and they have great language skills, you know, then, then the, the theory and stuff, I mean, they can really benefit from the non-language specific classes. But if that checking is not rigorous, then, then you're producing people who are not translators. Seriously. Okay? I mean, my... my original suggestion at the end of that paper was that the European Masters in Translation do what is done in the European Masters in Conference Interpreting and have a final European exam across the board. Let's see who can, let's see who can't. I would love to see that happen. The whole of Spain would fail and they'll, they'll realise I'm not really criticising you guys. My concern is the language competence of, uh, of students back in Spain, to tell you the truth. I'll have to edit the video. <laughs> but, but if you're producing for a profession, that's not a stupid idea, I think. A final exam to see who can and see who can't. We're not doing that at the moment. We're, we're operating on the, well, that's what I said about process, but it works the other way, on the supposition that if the process is correct, the product will be fine. That's not something we can, we can really uh, be sure of when it's based on self-report data as well. Nobody's checking what's actually happens. Mm -hmm. I think, just sorry, just on the question. 
question of uh, how universities treat uh, masters in uh, translation. I think that the problem for masters programming in the UK, at least, um, and which is kind of which is a big driver towards aggregation of the kind that you've been uh, demonstrating, is that kind of each module needs to be demonstrating typically enrollments in double figures, mm -hmm. and if you're trying to put on um, language courses at master's level between particular language pairs, then uh, you know, even if your degree program is, is, is buoyant, uh, then keeping up the numbers in those individual modules can be a real problem. Yep. It becomes an endless task to justify small programs to uh, university authorities. Yeah, it's commerce. It's commerce, it's finding ways of, of milking the Chinese market to keep other languages alive, which is not a bad thing to do. But this noble world vision that Schelling had of approaching the essence of God has become an internationalism of commerce, and I find that sad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for the thoughts for watching precisely in tune with what happened in British social anthropology. With the difference uh, that <clears throat> the translation of the other culture into English uh, at the, you know, would be into the language of knowledge and therefore truth, and that has been turned around into an engagement of the self, a self-questioning. If it's your L1 being put at stake here and putting it in relation with, with the L2 of the other culture, you are thereby involved in the process and have to think about you. That's all the more reason for using the anthropologist's first language to problematize the role of the self in that activity. They still just carry on to whatever they thought is best in Chinese and then translate it in English. But also think about who they are and what they're trying to do. Think about who they are. Why do they use those expressions and not other expressions? You could exploit the, the, the many uh, gaps and, and decalage, whatever that is, shifts between uh, English and Chinese, for example, if you're publishing and, and, and having the notes. There's a whole lot that can be done. But, but uh, one of the activities I use in class, uh, in the process class, is to have uh, students write about the most wonderful moment in my life, uh, some experience that's close to them, and then have that translated. And they see the translation is never what it was for them, even though it can be linguistically perfectly correct, because the experience they write about has language embedded in it. It's a linguistic experience as well. Uh, so it's it's what I'm trying to get across here. 
it's putting the self at risk in that translational relationship. It's not that Chinese is truer or English is truer. Okay. Okay. Uh, Karen, you had a question? It's gone. It, it was kind of going back to our earlier discussion um, about this with Chan. Isn't the problem that um, the problem starts much earlier than, than universities? Um, I think universities are already fighting a losing battle. If the government doesn't have um, a robust language, foreign language policy, for example, in this country, a Labour government got rid of uh, the GCSE requirement um, for having a, a, language, a foreign language and that's you know then, then feeds down or up to university where um where university language departments have fewer applicants so so the, the, the problem starts far earlier i think yeah, we're teaching for an international market australia has a very clear education is a, an export product mm -hmm. Uh, and we're playing the market as, as best we can. Mm -hmm. but, but if we don't have a home market, let's say, in the well, UK, of, of having enough applicants who, who come with the language requirements. Yeah, I mean, that, that's why we get into the stage of teaching translation without languages yeah. or doing corpus linguistic translation studies, corpus translation studies, all in English. Yeah. Harish Trivedi has a wonderful paper on this, on how English is now so great it doesn't need any other language to talk about translation. Mm -hmm. subsidies for cultural projects and what was the Centre National des Lettres and Art de la Lecture, I think. And uh, the French policy is very clearly to subsidize translations into French, whereas other countries want to export their literature. Mm -hmm. The French are really, really keen on bringing things in and making the space of French literature richer. Mm -hmm. I suspect um, that in philosophy it's similar. I know theses at, at uh, the uh, School of called the Altitude, whatever, it's the School of Social Sciences there, uh, are translations, notably from German, annotated, annotated translations. There have been quite a few over the years. So uh, the directionality, though, is important. It's, it's a culture that wants to bring other cultures into it. Yes. The, the first book I did was a translation by Sarah Kaufman, uh, uh, out of French, it was her book on Nietzsche, Nietzsche uh, sorry, uh, first book on Nietzsche, Nietzsche and Nietzsche. Um, and I, I remember being struck when, when it appeared, and this was my uh, first translation, I was very proud of it, I opened the, the cover, and there was an acknowledgement in there, which I had known nothing about, by my publisher, to uh, a French grant-making authority. Oh, really? For, yes. Okay, for, that's for great. Who, they had received to fund the translation of this work of French philosophy into English. So, so you're, you're indebted like, to the French... That was 1993, so... <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, I think, uh, a very last question, a quick one. Okay. <laughs> Just a, a small one. Um, you mentioned uh, near the beginning of the talk how um, 
of disciplines of um, use of translations, now they're quite liberating because they're not so escape from binaries in which they're trapped. Has it not at the same time perhaps just created a new binary of translation proper on the one hand and a kind of broad, slightly hard to pin down translation of metaphor? Yeah, this is uh, Derrida's great argument against Roman Jakobson's division of, you know, translation proper and then into semiotic and that, that things. Uh, strange enough, in this text, he goes to great lengths to defend la philosophie propre, ce qui est propre la philosophie, you know, philosophy in the true sense, which is this discourse that happens to go from Greek into German into French, but there could be other languages, he says, he doesn't name any other languages. Uh, yeah, there is power at work here in, in locating the center. His ultimate um, uses of translation are conservative, are linguistic, are looking for equivalents and, and, and working against equivalents to, to, to get this space of equivocation, uh, which I think is the reason why this text is not widely cited in translation studies. He was a conservative. 